it could it could it could be think of speakers, right? Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming this evening. Before we get started, I just wanted to welcome you all and, and do a few housekeeping notes like turning off cell phones, if you don't mind. There's washrooms just down the hall here to my left. There are accessible washrooms, if that's what you're looking for, across uh, the mezzanine behind you. <coughs> if there's an emergency, our closest exit is out the door and to the left down the hall. There's some stairs there. Just so you know, we are capturing this pre presentation for streaming online. And that means that the microphones and the cameras are live. So if you have a coughing fit, uh, you will be recorded in perpetuity. So you just might want to see if you can uh, help yourself uh, to keep that to a minimum. After the presentation, we will have some time for some, pr for some questions. And at that point, if you do have some questions, if you could come up to this microphone here, that way the, everybody can hear you both here in the room and on YouTube forever. Lastly, as I said, if you don't mind, just uh, put your phones on silent or turn them off. Thanks. <coughs> this evening's presentation was made possible through the support of Tilsonburg's Cultural Advisory Committee. So thank you very much to that group for making it possible. And the Tilsonburg Toastmasters Club is or has organized this for the evening. I wanna thank the advisory committee for supporting the initiative. And as far as Toastmasters goes, this isn't, a, this isn't intended as a sales pitch for Toastmasters, but I will say that in my relatively short time with Toastmasters, it's really all about helping people find their voice as individuals. And at one level, Black History Month is also about giving space for the voices of individuals and peoples that haven't always been given opportunities to speak. Tilsonburg is a place where there is not much visible diversity in the people who live here. That shouldn't be a surprise to any of us. But that being said, like every place in Canada, almost everywhere, Tilsonburg is a place where all of us, or almost all of us, come from other parts of the world either in our own lifetime or in a previous generation. Perhaps our parents or grandparents immigrated to the area as a result of the European wars in the first half of the last century, or perhaps even earlier. Regardless of where our individual histories are rooted, we all look at the issues of race and power and equality with a very personal and unique lens. Tonight, the conversation we're going to have is not one that has happened very often in Tilsonburg, certainly not in my time here, and certainly not in such a public forum. The three gentlemen in front of you all have a story to tell, and I'm very, very grateful that they've generously agreed to spend some time with us tonight. There is a history of black people coming to Oxford County, and in fact, nearby places like Otterville, Burgessville, Ingersoll, and Norwich are known to have many untold stories related to the Underground Railroad. And both escaped and freed slaves from America spent a lot of time here in the early 1800s. Black History Month was first celebrated in Ontario in 1993 to mark the 200th anniversary of a, 19, a 1793 law banning the importation of slaves into Upper Canada. In 2016, Ontario passed legislation to proclaim February as Black History Month, so on an annual basis, we can ensure the uniqueness, vitality, and continuing contributions of the black community in Ontario will be celebrated for generations to come. Tonight we're going to hear a brief overview of Black History Month and then some personal reflections from each of these speakers. After that, there will hopefully be some questions or comments and we can have a, sh a bit of question and answer. I'll ask you to keep your questions until that point in the program and now I'm going to introduce our speakers to you. Marcel Marcelin is the Director of Organizational Strategy at the City of London. In this role, he is responsible for providing vision, direction, and oversight to the city's strategic planning, governance, and performance processes. Marcel has over 22 years of experience as a public servant in the municipal sector, 
He's a former London police officer retiring as a, as a retired sergeant who also worked as a diversity consultant facilitating intercultural development training for public and private organizations, including P police services, Correctional Services Canada, and the Canada Border Sa Services Agency. He's a proud member of the province's anti-racism directorate subcommittee on anti-black racism. Marcel attended Western University where he studied public administration and earned a master's degree in business administration. Marcel's a classmate of mine in the parcel, par public administration courses. Lakin Afolabi on the other end is a criminal lawyer in London, Ontario. He was born in Nigeria and emigrated to Canada in 1984 with his mother and siblings to join his father who was already here for school. He grew up in Windsor, Ontario and obtained his first degree in political science at the world-renowned University of Windsor. He then traveled to Australia where he furthered his education by obtaining a JD, which I'm, means a doctor of jurisprudence. I had to look that up. He lives in London with his physiotherapist wife, Ibby. He, he says that if you're wondering why he looks sleep deprived, it's because <coughs> he's the father of three children all under the age of five, the first of which he delivered unassisted on his dining room floor. George McCauley it was born and raised in London, Ontario, and is the second son born into a family of four boys. He was a touring musician for most of his young life and with his brothers was nominated for a Juno in, 19, in the late 1990s for a best R&B solo recording. Also in the late 1990s, he earned a BSc and B ed from Western and followed up that 12 years later with a master's degree in anti-racism education, also from Western. George started with the London District Catholic School Board as a teacher in 1998 and is currently an international baccalaureate mathematics teacher at Catholic Central High School. He's also part of the coaches staff of both the football and basketball programs at CCH. George is the proud father of three amazing teenagers. Marcel, Lakin, George, resilience, local perspectives on the importance of Black History Month. Thank you, Rick. Um, I'm going to provide more of a, uh, an overview of Black History Month and less of a, uh, my personal experiences. And I'm going to leave it to my, my two colleagues here uh, to provide more of a, a personal uh, perspective on, uh, on Black History Month. So this year, the national theme for Black History Month is resilience. And resilience is defined as that ineffable quality that allows some people to be knocked down by life and come back stronger than ever. Rather than letting failure overcome them and drain their resolve, they find a way to rise from the ashes. Historically, this resilience is what underpins the significance of Black History Month. So let's take some time to briefly recount the advent of Black History Month. In 1926, a Harvard-educated African-American historian, Carter G. Woodson, proposed setting aside time devoted to honor the accomplishments of African Americans and to heighten the awareness of black history in the United States. This led to the establishment of the Negro History Week in 1926. Celebrations of black history began in Canada shortly thereafter, and during the early 1970s, the week became known as Black History Week. This was expanded into Black History Month in 1976. In December of 1995, the House of Commons officially recognized February as Black History Month in Canada. Now, Black History Month has been the subject of some criticism. Some argue that it's unfair to devote an entire month to a single group of people. Others contend that we should celebrate Black History Month throughout the entire year, as opposed to just one month. Celebrating honors historic leaders uh, in the black community. And so despite the debate, I believe that there is some good uh, in devoting a season to remembering people who have made priceless deposits into the account of our nation's history. Heroes like Martin Luther King and on our side of the border, Viola Davis, Lincoln Alexander, Jean Augustine, William Hall, Josiah Henson, Ferguson Jenkins, Elijah McCoy, and Harriet Tubman. These people and many more deserve to be honored for their sacrifice and suffering they endured for the sake of equality. Celebrating helps us be better stewards of the privileges we've gained. Sometimes we can take for granted the rights many of these heroes sweated and bled for. Celebrating also provides an opportunity 
to highlight the best of black history and culture. All too often, only the most negative aspects of black communities get highlighted. We hear about the poverty rates, incarceration rates, and the achievement gaps. We're inundated with negative images of unruly athletes and entertainers as paradigms of success for black people. Unfortunately, this can all lead to unfair stereotypes and assumptions about an entire group of people who have much more to offer. Celebrating creates awareness for all people. When we observe Black History Month, we give people of all races the opportunity to learn. Celebrating reminds us that black history is really our history. I'll pass it over to George. And ladies and gentlemen and Rick and the Toastmasters Club, thank you very much for having us out tonight for this Black History Month event. And I wanna say a very special thanks to my friend Marcel and Lacken for uh, joining me tonight and, and being able to do this with you. We, we're, we're grateful for the opportunity. When I first thought about this evening, I wasn't sure where I was gonna take the talk. I had many options that had been explored and taken, but for some guidance, I deferred to my father, Winston. When I asked about the climate of the city in this area when he first arrived in 1969 as a young, educated newlywed from the beautiful highland of Grenada in the West Indies, he said it was extremely cold and harsh. Now I should qualify by telling you that my parents arrived there in the summertime. And needless to say, he wasn't talking about the weather. Decent jobs and apartments were very difficult to find, and the police were routinely pulling over and questioning black people for fitting the description. And that got me thinking, how did I get here? Both my parents are highly educated and employed individuals. My father, now retired, was a social worker and worked at what I still refer to as London Psychiatric Hospital up on Highbury. My mother, a certified elementary teacher, owns and is still the director of the oldest Montessori school in our city. They were my heroes and they were my first role models. When we were kids, our parents instilled in us a resilience and attitude that kept us looking past and above any negativity that could distract or derail us, not only with their words, but also with their actions. As members of the London Urban Alliance on Race Relations and other committees that focused on multicultural, race and ethnic relations in London in the mid 80s, they worked hard to advocate for cultural sensitivity and employment equity. In one such meeting with the Board of Education, when asked for job opportunities for young black individuals, a member of the board offered that there were plenty of jobs for custodians and support workers. When they were specific and said, we want teaching jobs, the member looked up and said, make no mistake, we are not going to lower our standards for you. Well, if I can be honest, the standards to which he was referring are a thin veil for the glass ceiling that we did not construct, nor should we bear the burden of trying to break through. Once again, how did I get here? When I was a student growing up in London, Ontario, there was not a lot of diversity in the classroom, nor in the halls. It was not uncommon to hear the odd racist joke capitalizing on some ridiculous bias or stereotype that would elicit a laugh from students and in some cases some staff. In one instance, I clearly remember a teacher remark, Gary, who's my older brother, and George are black, but they're not black, black. Floored by the comment, it was supposed to be a compliment I was offended and that remark has stayed with me for some 27 years. This was not a compliment. It was an insult to me and any student who I was actually seen as being black, whatever that connotation would mean. Which begs the question, what is black? And what does it mean to be black black to a black person and to a non-black person? And this is what has brought me here this evening. How did I get here? Well, take a look at me. Six foot one. 200 and, well, let's call it over 200 pounds. <clears throat> Black man with long dreads. That's a description. What do you see? Screams calculus teacher, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, it does. I'm a calculus teacher. In my very enjoyable 20 years at Catholic Central High School, 
visitors often and invariably peg me at a level different from the position I actually held. There's absolutely nothing wrong with being an EA or a custodian, but I wonder why they seldom guess that I was their son or daughter's calculus teacher. I did not come here today to give you the bad news because there is good news. There's a lot of good news. Why is it important to celebrate Black History Month? Well, to keep alight the torches that have been handed down to us through the feats of our black heroes and role models through the ages. And what I chose to focus on tonight is why it is important not only to celebrate Black History Month, but to also be a role model and present a positive image in our community. My parents, both successful and positive role models in our community, and in my very own home, served as fantastic role models for me. And there's a young black character on the television show A Different World main, named Dwayne Wayne, who is a very cool and good-looking calculus teacher, uh, a black individual. And I had never seen a character like that on television before. He directly cemented in my head that I could do that very thing. And for the people like the board member who decided that giving black people a chance would necessitate lowering standards, and for my former non-black teacher who had his own distorted views of what it meant to be black. It is important that we have black people in prominent positions of authority in all walks of life, not just to serve as important role models for young black people, but to serve as different and positive images to help deconstruct some of the stereotypes and biases that non-black individuals hold as well. What is wrong with imagining a mad scientist who doesn't look like Doc Brown from Back to the Future? or that your mathematics teacher can look like me. Having equity and equality, having equity and equal opportunity is not about lowering standards, but about being a positive role model in a position to facilitate the change in perceptions and biases about who you see. And in this respect, we have come a long way. So if you ask, as I did my father, what the climate is, I would tell you, I've taken off my gloves and my jacket, but I think I'll keep my sweater and boots just a little longer. Uh, I appreciate the time you gave us tonight, and uh, uh, I do want to say that um, having these gentlemen beside me is an inspiring thing tonight, and I hope that in the little conversation we have tonight, we can shed a little light on why it is important to maintain Black History Month going forward. Thank you very much. My turn. I want to start by telling you a story that took place when I was articling in Toronto, and I took a trip down the 401 with a few friends, and we went to a Christmas party. I was there with my colleague at the time, Dennis Gregoris, and he had a bachelor party that he had to attend. So we were think we were all in the same vehicle, and we all ended up going. So there's me, there's Dennis, and I believe there are three females rolling up at a bachelor party. Dennis entered, no problem, I entered. And then the three girls who were nicely dressed, pretty girls. And you saw all the guys in the room look around and I was just waiting for someone to make an inappropriate joke of to the purpose that those women were serving. It was very clear that they were different because you don't have women at a bachelor party unless they're attending to certain carnal issues and that's not what those women were <laughs> there for. Um, but it was clear they were different. And, and the point of my talk today is that differences are not important. I'll get that to I will get back to that later. I have a few stories I'd like to share with you. The first story is me as a lawyer. And th this story has occurred many times in different versions. As a new lawyer in London, Ontario, there have been times when I've requested disclosure. Disclosure is the evidence that's provided for lawyers on behalf of the clients. And when I first started, before people knew who I was, I'd be told disclosure is for lawyers only. And, and that made me wonder, why did you not think I was a lawyer? Is it because of how I was dressed? Because I'm dressed like I dress now. Later on, I remember being in the lawyer's room once. So there's a lounge in the Middlesex Law Association in London that's for lawyers. And someone asked me, are you a lawyer? And I said, yes, I'm a lawyer. And I thought it would end there. But she later asked that I provide her with identification to confirm that I was a lawyer. Again, I wonder what about me made her think that I wasn't a lawyer. 
in undergrad, I had political delusions. I wanted to go far in politics, and I was often involved in student associations. I sat on many boards. I sat on many working groups, ad hoc committees, and everything else that uh, clogs the bureaucratic system of the world-class University of Windsor, where I attended for my undergraduate. Um, wh while there, I remember attending an event at the... Herb Gray, uh, no, an event in honor of Herb Gray, who was a former Deputy Prime Minister of Canada, and he was a very long-serving liberal cabinet member in Windsor. Everyone attended there, and it, they were serving hors d'oeuvres, and I remember people asking me where the drinks were, trying to offer me the plates. And again, I wondered, why did you think I was serving? We were all dressed the same, and I sat on very similar boards. My student who's here present, he told me a story. He's been in London very briefly, and he dresses well. Not as well as I do, of course, because he's just a student. But he does all right. <laughs> and uh, he was trying to enter the lawyer's room, and he was blocked. And someone said, what are you doing? And he said, I'm grabbing my stuff. And she stood there as if she was preventing him from entering. Eventually, she let him go, and she let him grab his stuff. Again, what was it about him? See, Differences are not important. Let me tell you one last story. I remember in Windsor, I used to play hockey in, at the ice parks. I, I joked that I wanted to make it to the NHL, the Nigerian Hockey League. And while there, I remember entering the dressing room with my, I was going to say luggage. It's been that long since I've played. With my hockey bag. <laughs> I've only played hockey once since I became a lawyer. It's sad. And uh, if I keep having kids, it's probably never going to happen again. But uh, I remember entering the dressing room with my hockey bag in hand. And as soon as I entered, it was full of mostly white people. Everyone went silent. They looked at me. And then they looked at each other. And they burst into laughter. I was different, admittedly so. But again, differences are not important. As a lawyer, the considerations that sometimes have to make are, are troubling. As a business owner and wannabe entrepreneur, the considerations and the discussions that I have with my partner are, are kind of troubling. I, I remember discussing with my uh, a side business that I have about the kind of models we were going to use and the diversity and whether or not having too much black people might send the wrong message because I had few more, I had more, I guess, a, a larger pool of black people to choose from. And that was a troubling consideration. Um, see, with my student now, and I, I thought of putting him on the website that I have for my law office, and I've also thought of the implications that people might draw. And there's been a little bit of hesitation. And again, I, I find that troubling, because if I, as a black man, have these kind of reluctances and these kind of hesitations and even these kind of prejudices against presenting other black people. If I, as someone who has suffered numerous instances of racism throughout my life, and I could tell you many, many stories, and any black person, I'm sure, can share you their stories, and we could try and all one-up each other about the stories we've experienced as a result of racism, straight racism. If I have that kind of hesitation because I think it might be bad for my business, then what do people that have no stake in the matter think, right? It really makes me wonder. See, it takes a certain amount of courage and financial risk for me to brand a certain way. And that same type of courage and financial risk applies to a white person that doesn't have a lifetime of racist stories to share with other people. So back to the point that I keep on making. Differences aren't very important. I would submit that they're very arbitrary and we could classify everyone in this room based on our blood types and then de decide that we're going to treat each people differently if you're O negative or O or A plus or, or whatever the blood type may be. And then we could use that as an important difference. It's not the differences that are important, but it's the significances that we attach to the differences. That is what's important. And those significances 
could be very arbitrarily defined. I went to law school in Australia, and I've been told going there and while I was there that Australia is one of the most racist, xenophobic places that you could ever go to. And indeed, that is true. But while I was there, I was very different. And the difference that I had worked in my favor because I was this Nigerian-born person that was raised in Canada, so I spoke like a Canadian, but I looked like a Nigerian. And I had a good appreciation of Canadian culture, and I seemed like a Canadian in speech and in custom, but I appeared as a Nigerian physically. People found that to be very exotic. They found it to be endearing. I was cool. People wanted to befriend me. I was different, but the significance that was attached to my s difference was a positive one that I enjoyed. It was bizarre. It was intriguing. It was intriguing. The difference that I experienced had a different significance attached to it. So the takeaway, prejudice is something we don't want to confront in ourselves. I have my own prejudices. I remember a case that I'm working on right now where I got a call that a Middle Eastern gentleman was r accused of uh, sexual assault. And my initial reaction was to think, oh, well, you know, you might come from a culture that doesn't respect women. And, and I was kind of hesitant. And I, 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 I realized my own prejudices, right? And it's very difficult to identify and deal with your prejudices. But prejudice is real. I think the first step in admitting and dealing with prejudices is acknowledging them. We all have our prejudices. And prejudices are, some people argue that it's a psychological defense mechanism because something that's different, or whatever it may be. You could identify your prejudices. And the first step to dealing with prejudices is to identify them. Because if you're so scared to admit that you have prejudices, you can never, ever fix them. If we do this, we could all work together to end prejudice. We could all work together to end racism. There's a hymn that my mom has sang to me, and it says, Lord, send a revival. Let it start in me. And that same idea of starting with you is something that it could very well be applied to prejudice. So I look around this room and I say, how many of us want to work together to end prejudice? I'm sure that most of you, hopefully, will join me in saying, yes, let's work together. But then, if that's, to, if that's the case and if that is to be, it has to start with you, and you have to identify your own prejudices. Lastly, I want to quote, I want to end with a quote by Gandhi, and he says, be the change that you want to see in your world. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Wonderful. You've you've given us a lot to think about, and I'm throwing stuff on the floor as we go. Did any of you have any further comments in response to something somebody said before I open the floor to questions? Can you push? Yeah. Maybe we'll uh, we'll take some questions, and that will probably spur some uh, some more uh, some more conversation. Sure. Well. Folks, are there any comments or questions from the audience? Please come on up to the podium here so we can pick up your voice. Yeah. Gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, my name's Jake Fagan, and I have a bit of a story to tell, too, that will possibly fit in with what these gentlemen have shared. I was born in Holland. My parents dragged me out of that country in 1951. I was about this tall. The interesting part is I was an immigrant or a child of an immigrant. My first language was Dutch. Our first sponsors lived down in the Chatham area. And Kent County is rich in black history, very, very rich in black history. Our first sponsoring family was actually a, a, a couple that was going to retire that year from farming. But it was established that uh, six days before we got on the boat, 
to come to Canada. Our sponsors up in Eastern Ontario had to back out. My parents were told, come anyway, we'll find you a sponsor. So we took the boat to New York City, the train to Buffalo, the train to Hamilton. And when we got to Hamilton, we found out we were going to Chatham because we didn't know where we were going. One year later, that couple retired and my parents had to find a place to work. They had the opportunity to speak with a number of farmers in the Kent County area and they were able to make an arrangement with the Prince family. The Prince family originally came to Kent County on the Underground Railroad. And the interesting takeaway from that is, and that's what my father instilled in me, the best deal that he could find for that second year that we were in this country was with a family that had their roots in Southern slavery and had their freedoms here. We were there a little better than a year and the young people that I played with, I caught up with again in high school. Yes, they were black, but not in my eyes. They were kids that I played with and all through high school, they suffered, yes, prejudice. And you know what? I did too. Why? Because I was Dutch. In fact, I had teachers that said to me, you know, you think you're Dutch, but you're really not much. And I can remember a teacher saying to a young lady who had a similar background to mine that she wasn't much. These were teachers. So I know where you're coming from. The interesting part is I never had a problem with any of it because I also was part of that. I went to Fanshawe College before it was Fanshawe College, Ontario Vocational Center, London. My lab partner in the two years I was there, his name was Moss Ka. Not much of a Canadian name. Came from the same area that your parents did. He was a foreign student and we had a great time. I'm really happy that Black History Month is something that we can all be a part of. And it doesn't matter if you're black, white, or whatever. You fellas, and maybe some of you here, have gone through things that I know all about. And the interesting part is, there is no difference if we rise above it. And I hope that you people will continue to rise above it. Because there's, I just don't have any time for that kind of stuff. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Jack. Uh, come on up, please. <laughs> Look out. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Mayola, and I'm uh, unfortunately very underdressed. <laughs> I wish I wore my thirty. He, he wasn't dressed like this when they blocked. Yes, no, I wasn't. I was in the suit. I, yeah, I'm the student of which you heard a few stories about. Uh, I, I think the, the we've a, a very a lot of very interesting, important points have been raised, but uh, something very important that I think we need to take away from this is. Um, the fact that the enemy of um, the enemy of getting along is guilt, is discomfort, is the fact that many people are so burdened by the f fear of admitting that people that look like them have been responsible for inhibiting another set of people that they do not want to confront the fact that they may actually be part of the problem because it makes them feel like less of people or less of human. And rather than do that, they stuff it and pretend like it doesn't happen. 
Now, this city has done something really impressive. They have confronted a situation, a dynamic situation that is not something that you actually have to because I don't think there are a lot of black people in this city. <laughs> but then the, the question is, the only way you can fix a prejudice is to understand the people that you're prejudiced against. It's very easy to create a caricature of a people, to create an image of a people in your head that you haven't talked to, an image of a people you haven't met, people you have never interacted with, if you do not step outside your comfort zone and interact with them and understand them as a people. When I'm in the airports, it's very annoying. Like, I always get randomly selected to get searched. <laughs> always, like, now I just walk towards the guy. I'm like, yeah, fine, uh, search me. But then, the, all they see is a 6'2", yeah, six point I win. <laughs> a six two black male with a beard. And you're so sure I have to be some sort of menace. I have to be a problem. He he looks so different, he has to be a problem. But they if they only got to talk to me, they'll realize how much of a charm I am and how handsome I am and how yeah. <laughs> But the truth is, if we step past our discomfort, if we step past the fact that we don't want to identify with the evil in ourselves or in the evil that we might have been culpable to, then we can never fix it. We can never be different. We, like, um, the quote in Bushy case, I'm sorry, this is not a Black History <laughs> One story, but on Facebook, I read a lot of comments and I make a lot of comments. I'm a social justice warrior. <laughs> Just kidding. But you read and people do not want to even consider the fact that something might be wrong. I, I, I come from Nigeria, so my story is different from a lot of um, uh, black people that grew up here. Because in Nigeria, there's no black people, there's no white people, we're just people, right? It's a country full of black people, and the hierarchies aren't divided by race. So I came here, and for the first time, I realized that looking different or sounding different or having a different name had an impact on how much success you could achieve as a person. I was applying for articling. That's how I ended up in London. And most people won't even call me for an interview because all they see is the Ayola or Deyemi, like weird sounding name, like, ooh, <laughs> we don't want to mess with that, right? But then the people I was able to talk to and interact with seemed surprised at how, uh, how, much, how, how much I knew or how smart I sounded. And that is part of the problem. The problem is you shouldn't be surprised that a person is capable of knowledge or a person is capable of being smart or a person is capa capable of intelligence. If you only stepped out of your comfort zone and interacted with people who were different, they wouldn't be so different and there would be no more prejudice. I'm sorry it was a prepared speech. Probably could have been better if I wrote it down, but thank you for this opportunity <laughs> and it's nice to <laughs> Questions or I comments, wonder if we, Marcel, uh, maybe yeah? we could uh, just comment on uh, what um, was just said uh, with respect to difference. And you know, uh, discrimination uh, cuts across many different um, identities. And so, you know, I can admit the biases that I hold, the prejudices that I hold, uh, and uh, it, so it is important to recognize. Uh, why you do, why you think, why you feel the way that you do. Uh, one of the things that I had to overcome and that I had to work on uh, was um, some of the things that I, I was taught as uh, a young uh, Christian growing up in a very religious household. Um, I had to overcome uh, when I was working in the field of diversity, uh, working with members of the LGBT community. Uh, so even though I was the, the uh, victim of racism and discrimination uh, on the basis of my race, um, you know, I still harbored thoughts and opinions uh, and ideas about members of the LGBT community that would be considered uh, equally as um, harmful uh, to that particular community. And so I, I made it uh, a mission in my life to make sure that I was not only consistent with the way that I treated people, but consistent with the way that I actually uh, evaluate myself uh, from an emotional perspective to make sure that I'm not you know, harboring some of the same things that I, I'm telling people uh, that they shouldn't, shouldn't harbor. So I think it's important to think about you know, discrimination across identities um, and it makes you a better person. 
Thanks, Marcel. Any further comments from uh, Ken or George? That's very well said. That's very well said. I think if we can identify that we ourselves do have those biases and we each have things we have to work through and, and, and overcome as we approach these situations, I think it does make the world a better place. Clinton. Hello. Hello. My name is Clinton Springer. I am a Toastmaster. Earlier today, I was uh, down here speaking at Tilsonburg Toastmasters. And uh, Rick was concerned about the turnout. And he says, I got some guys that are coming in. Who are these guys? And I says, you know, I know these guys very well. I stand here <coughs> very proud. I'm a bit older than some of these gentlemen here. But I am so proud of these three gentlemen because they are what I called the hidden black man. They said something earlier that when people see them, they suffer the same prejudice within their own community, our community. Because of the way they speak, the way they carry themselves, what they represent, there's also something attached to them. They're not black enough. See, President Obama said, a young black man with a book isn't acting white. And a young white boy with his pants down isn't acting black. They said something, we asked, why when people look at us, they think that something different about us? I ask you to ask yourself, or your friends, what it is within you that makes you think that way? What makes you think when you look at the black man, when you look at the black people, you think, well, there's something different. What it is that makes you think that way? What is it within you? And that's where the change has to come from. What make you feel, what value did you put on somebody else that make you think that there's a difference between us? Because I will tell you, our skin color is not what makes us different. That's what makes us unique. There's over seven billion people in the world. You wouldn't find any two the same. We're all different, regardless of our skin color, our gender, our race. But that's what makes us unique. So we've got to stop looking at ourselves from being different and being, to being unique. And it starts with us when we see our friends, as you said, what we go through, when you hear somebody gets stabbed by the police, or you see an injustice, an injustice to one, and it is an, is an injustice to all of us. So it requires us, not just on Black History Month, to kind of speak up. But when you see something happens, it requires us to say, that's wrong. Not just to say it at home, but to say, that should not happen. Not just to a black person or black people, because there's an important word here, people. We are all people. So let's stand up, not just in February, but after February. And when you see him walking down the street, don't see the differences in him. Find out who he is and what he knows. Because that's how we learn, that's how we grow, and that's how we come together. Not to be judged by the color of our skin, but by the content of our character. And we're looking at three character people here. I want to thank Tilsonburg Toastmasters for doing this because as a Toastmaster, I have tried to get other clubs to have forums like this, but there were concerns. It might be prejudice. We don't want to go, you know, we don't want to make it sound so, you know, we don't want to bring up the race talk. We don't want to have this kind of meeting, so I thank, I thank Rick for opening up this forum, and maybe next year we would have more Toastmasters in places like London, more clubs, more of our clubs doing something like this. I thank you guys for coming out, and we appreciate it. Marcel, Akin, George, 
thank you very much for speaking with us this evening. It's been an eye-opening and mind-expanding time for me, and I'm sure others in the room as well. Your words are going to stay with me for sure for a long time. Folks, uh, that brings us to the end of the evening. Thank you again to the Cultural Advisory Committee for their support of this program and Tilsonburg Toastmasters. If anyone is interested in finding out more about Toastmasters, there are several of us here in the room. Clinton, of course, Laura is here, and Monica. Uh, we could answer some questions if you have them, or just come on out to one of our Toastmaster Club meetings and see what it's all about. We meet Mondays from noon to 1 p.m. at the museum. There are a lot of munchies on the tables outside, so please, if you choose to stand and chat and talk with each other and with our guests, I threw that on the floor again, uh, with our guests for a few minutes, please do take some nibbles for the journey home and wherever that is, journey safely. My challenge to you all is to continue thinking about what you heard this evening. Differences do not matter. The significance we attach to those differences does. Consider what that means in your life, and don't wait until next February, as Clinton was saying, don't wait until next February rolls around to have those conversations with your families and with your colleagues about these issues. Thanks for coming. Good night. Gentlemen, thank you.